I'm Mark Bittman. This is Dominique Crenn, Daphne Miller, Matt Barnard. Um, and I'm going to, I'll introduce myself and then I'll let each of them introduce each other, themselves, sorry. Um, this panel is about um, local food and human health. Um, it's going to be bigger than that, as, as you'll see. Um, I'm Mark Bittman. I've been writing about food for uh, 30 plus years, including a stint at the New York Times. And I'm currently writing about uh, the history of food and humanity. And um, as I said, I'll be moderating. Dominique. Hello. It's the first time in Austin. It's a cool city. <laughs> Um, uh, but it's, it's been kind of amazing to be here, and uh, we're very, um, it's, been, it's been lovely. We haven't, e ate, we haven't eaten barbecue yet, so we want to know which place is the best one. So if you have any insight, <laughs> which one? Franklin. All right, okay. Um, I I, supposed to be oh, I have to introduce myself. Okay, so um, I'm, uh, my name is Dominique Ren. Uh, I live in San Francisco. Um, I... San Francisco people here? Yeah. Okay, right. Um, I, um, I'm a cook. I have three restaurants, working on the fourth one. Uh, we have a farm also in Sonoma, and that's it. And I'm French. <laughs> I'm Daphne Miller, uh, also from the Bay Area, Berkeley, across the Bay. And uh, I'm a family physician. Uh, I actually still see patients for part of my living. And I also work in the food system. And I'm very interested in the connections between farms and agriculture and food production and our own cells. And I'll, we'll be contributing a little bit of that perspective to the conversation. Anybody in healthcare in the room here? Oh, good. Okay, it's always nice to hear that you're coming to these kinds of talks. So. Uh, Matt Bernard, I uh, am with a company called Plenty, and at Plenty what we have done is we've worked to, to bring the farm inside uh, towards the end of making uh, nutrient-rich food, fruits and vegetables, uh, available to a lot uh, more people around the planet, uh, taste better, and uh, divorce the connection between uh, you know, growing populations and rising incomes from the stresses that has historically put on land and water. So that's what we do. Um, I'm going to start by a, a little comment about South by Southwest and say why this panel, I think, is a bit different. Um, South, I don't need to tell you that South by Southwest is a slightly techy um, gathering. And um, if you look at the list of food panels that are here, many of them are about creating new forms of food, improving the way seeds work or improving the way photosynthesis works, um, and so on. And our panel is a little bit different because um, it's almost as if we are back to naturists, although not quite. But we do believe that normal food grown in good ways, um, which have a basis in tradition, will nurture humans and the earth. Um, and I think that that's, you guys okay with that statement? I haven't cleared that with them. But I think that that's where we're coming from, and it's a little bit different than we have to reinvent food, we have to um, reinvent how it's grown, we have to reinvent seeds, and so on. We think, I believe that we think that the knowledge to making a good food system is already there, and that it's a matter of will and a matter of policy and a matter of politics and a matter of economics that will get us there. So um, having said that, I think the person that's doing the most innovative in the, in the South by Southwest uh, way um, food work here is Matt. So I'll let him speak first about his work and about what he believes and then we'll, we'll take it from there. Thanks, Mark. Uh, you know, what, what, we're, what we're doing at Plenty and what we're focused on is, is how do we get more nutrient-rich foods into the diets and lives of, of people both here in America and around the planet. Uh, and the reason we're doing that is because uh, it has been shown that nutrient-rich, diverse diets are associated with longer, healthier lives. 
And so we think in order to make that true, uh, some things have to happen. So one is fruits and vegetables need to just taste amazing. Uh, they need to taste amazing all the time. They need to be available all the time. Uh, and they need to be uh, less perishable. So they, they need to last longer in the fridge. Uh, because you can see across income deciles, uh, the, the, the consumption of fruits and vegetables changes wildly uh, from the bottom to the top by multiples. Uh, and that's largely because uh, if, if there is a high chance that you have to throw something away uh, with a constrained budget, you're not going to buy it. And that's exactly what ends up happening is people don't buy perishable food uh, the lower the in their income levels get. So uh, what you see is you see, you see the industrial diet around the world. This is a high-calorie, low-nutrient diet uh, driving the pandemics of the world, which uh, you know, include uh, obesity and diabetes. So... Um, we are, what we're working on is just making fruits and vegetables taste more amazing than most people have ever experienced, uh, such that we can then work to make them available to more people around the planet. Matt, um, I just want to pick up on one thing you said. Uh, when you're talking about longer shelf life, you're actually, I believe you're actually talking about shorter shipping times. I, I mean, I'm, or maybe I'm wrong. But. Th that is a major component of why it, why it is that the, the food coming from a plant farm lasts longer. Uh, but there are other reasons, too. So if you think about um, uh, the com kind of the industrial food supply of, of you know, say, a, a lettuce or a strawberry grown in the, out in the field, it gets picked, it gets aggregated, it gets pelletized, uh, it gets put on a truck, it goes to a pack house, where it gets unloaded, it gets unpacked, it gets washed, it gets packed, it gets put back on a pallet, it gets put on a truck, it goes to a distribution center, to another truck, to a store. Uh, so that's a lot of handling steps, uh, and I simplified it. Uh, so there's more than that. And, and every handling step lowers shelf life. Um, and uh, what's also happening in order to sell produce in the store is that because the field isn't controlled, it gets washed in bleach and saline on top of it. And so bleach and saline also tend to drive down shelf life uh, as well. So uh, what we're trying to do is get people food, food, like I said, that just tastes great, but also that, that doesn't go bad or slimy within a couple days in the fridge, uh, because that's another way to help people both trust the food they're buying and enjoy it more. So, uh, so there, are, there are five or six factors, actually, that drive that longer shelf life, but time and distance is, uh, is definitely uh, an important one. Um, Dominique, could you talk a little bit about the role of local food in serving plant food in restaurants? Um, yes. Um, so, I mean, we, we're very lucky in, in the Bay Area. I think we, uh, we can say that we're kind of a bubble, you know. Uh, we have um, an incredible um, uh, array of, of an amount of, of, of farmers out there that we can buy directly and it's local and we have great weather and you know everybody is, is involved but i think i think as a chef it's very important to understand um local food and local community for a lot of reasons um first of all community is probably the number one things that will keep uh, us to be able to create and to live better um, when when I met um, when I met Matt, it was it was intriguing to me because it's like okay, hold on, I, you know I'm we have a farm, we're growing our, our own vegetable, and if we don't have those vegetables, we go directly to the farmers that we know, and what I will be interested in what you're doing, and and listening to what he's doing is just kind of switch a little bit my way of looking at thing and. And I realized that I need to be more curious about what is what local food means. Um, I understand also the problem that we have when we um, when we farming, because at the farm we have a lot of problems. Sometimes there is a lot of water. Sometimes we don't get things, you know. But being local is is also good for the soul. So it was kind of like, but you're not, you know, growing you know, in, on the, in the field and what are you doing for the soul. So it's a, it's, 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 it was a very interesting way of me looking at it. I, um, I, I don't believe in supermarket and industrialization of food. I think everybody knows that. Um, locally doesn't mean that um, 
you have to buy everything local because there's a lot of crap out there. <laughs> Uh, but I think it's to be very, to be thoughtful about, you know, where things come from, understanding where things come from and how they go on and, and, and be close to your farmers or your rancher or your fishermen is one of the most, uh, uh, I think it's the most important uh, skill that you have to have. And um, then from that you can do delicious food, but it's also being curious and being educated. Um, everybody knows that we live in a world of, it's a crazy world right now, you know, climate change, and, and then my industry is responsible for all that. And I'm taking the responsibility also, even if I, we're trying to do things differently, is we have to bring awareness that we need to understand where the food comes from, and locally, obviously, is, for me, is the best way. It's just a, it's kind of a nice circle of it. Daphne, the sort of importance of localness, local food, and health? Well, it's interesting because uh, being on this panel, I, just to share this with the audience, I was excited to be on it because I actually saw a lot that I could learn from sitting between these two folks. And there are things that I have not been able to reconcile in my own mind in terms of how we truly can democratize healthy food? How can we get nutrient-dense, tasty food to everybody and not just folks who can afford it? And how can we get it in a way that is you know, energy efficient and so on? So I actually uh, recently visited Plenty and visited Matt's operation in South San Francisco, which from the outside looks like just another airport hangar you know, attached to the San Francisco airport. But you go in and it is this vertical farm with people wearing hard hats instead of farmer's hats. And they're you know, working in this sort of self-contained environment, growing uh, this vertical produce. And my questions and questions that I have about this idea of growing food locally in this very different way is what are the trade-offs and what are the advantages? For example, Matt just talked about shelf life and how food traveling longer distance, it's going to lose nutrients along the way. And some of the most powerful ones being phenolics and things that are really good for our health. But there's another reality there too, and that is as we've been breeding for our modern food, we've been choosing shelf life over nutrient density and taste. And in fact, sometimes those things are really mutually exclusive when it comes to um, wh what kind of varieties or genetics of the plants you're gonna grow. The exact things that give them flavor are also the ones that make them not last so long on the shelf. So this is more a question, how do you reconcile that? Another question I have is that this is something that we want to get into the poorest communities in this country and be a nutrition resource in those communities. And yet we're starting with chefs who are charging you know, a lot per plate and making fantastic food. But how do we then move from there to you know, democratizing this? And what are the steps between that and the community? So I guess I come here just to ask more questions, if that's OK. <laughs> um, and I'd love to hear your, both of your comments on that. Well, we can so, do that. So, <laughs> uh, so I'll, I'll share a story. This, uh, Daphne's a, a, absolutely right. In, in many cases, the, the optimization of what crops are grown is completely determined by the supply chain that gets them to the people who eat them. So I, I was uh, sitting down talking to one of the largest growers in the Salinas Valley in California, which is called the salad bowl of the world. Uh, California, for those of you who don't know, is a prolific producer of fruits and vegetables, more tomatoes in any country in the world, more strawberries in any country in the world, more lettuce in any countries in the world. And, and I, could, I could keep going. Uh, but he, he said to me, he said, Matt, we can't imagine a world where demand drives supply. He essentially said, we, we don't have the option to listen to customers. And <clears throat> he went on to explain, he said, we have data from consumers 
uh, that tells us we shouldn't even be growing iceberg lettuce, and yet it's the largest cash crop in fruits and vegetables in the United States of America uh, because it's a tank in the field. It withstands whatever the environment throws at it. We don't have any control over our production environment, but it has no flavor, no nutrition, uh, and that's the thing that gives us certainty with an uncertain production environment. It gives us certainty that we will have a business next year. So we grow iceberg lettuce. He said, but what the, what the data shows is that people like things like radicchio and arugula. And we can't grow radicchio in the field because it's too finicky. But wow, it's healthier and it sure does taste a lot more interesting. So, you know, that's the thing that, that we have the option to do at Plenty is because we brought the farm inside and are able to impose a lot more control th than, than the production environment in the field is we start with varieties and genetics, as Daphne was saying, that just taste more interesting and are more nutritious. Uh, so uh, so that's, that's something that we're super excited about is, you know, we put our, our crops uh, in front of people. Uh, oftentimes, they don't recognize them. And then they taste them and they say, oh my gosh, how did you get your greens to taste like this? Or I'll, I'll, I'll buy every single strawberry you ever grow. So, uh, you know, they're just, it's, it's, very, it's very exciting. And, um, you know, we think that this is a way uh, really to get more nutrient-rich diets into the lives of people around the planet. Can we just unpack, you and I have had this conversation, but can we talk a little bit about resource use between comparing indoor farming and outdoor? conventional farming and, sure. and talk about wh what you think things might look like in five or ten years? In five or ten years? Yeah, first I'll say, uh, you know, there is no one mode of production in agriculture that is a panacea. Uh, I see what we're doing at Plenty as, as necessary uh, in, in order for us to have, a, you know, a, an entire production system that, that feeds and nourishes people. Um, but if you look at what has traditionally been true in the field uh, as, as populations grow and incomes rise, people demand a couple things of their diets, and one of them is they demand more fruits and vegetables. And fruits and vegetables are very, very water intensive. Uh, the agriculture generally uh, accounts for about 70 to 80 percent of all water consumption on the planet. And we at Plenty are using about 1 percent the water that the field does to grow the exact same crop. So it's, it's highly water efficient. We have a beautiful closed loop system where we're able to reuse these resources. Uh, and we use less than 1% of the land. You know, on a, on, a, on, a, on a two and a half acre footprint, we can grow 400 to 500 acres worth of conventional field uh, production. So it's, it's very, very efficient, both from a land and water perspective and a nutrient perspective. We don't, you know, in the, in the field it requires uh, either um, you know, in regenerative farming, which uh, Daphne has done a lot of writing about, uh, there, there are ways to nourish the soil. Uh, in commercial or industrial scale farming, it tends to be fertilizers spread over the soil. Uh, that, that second way is a very inefficient way to use resources, and we use a fraction of, of, uh, of those resources, which are often uh, in the field there, that's a petroleum-based process. So, um, so we, we also put a lot uh, lighter demand on, on that than what is typical. I mean, Daphne, I, I know you only want to ask questions. You don't want to answer any, but... Um, <laughs> I'm happy to answer some. <laughs> Matt's sort of comparing intensive indoor rational farming to um, irrational conventional farming. Um, can you talk a little bit about what the sort of third path is? Yeah, well, first of all, I do want to say that I absolutely agree with what Matt just said, that there is not going to be one solution to how we as communities are going to come together and feed ourselves. And that what is so exciting about what's happening now is that we are taking a complexity approach and really thinking of all the different ways that we can produce um, healthy food. And I see what the work that Matt is doing is actually a really vital part of this. And I also agree that I would much rather take those indoor operations than a really inefficient, polluting, soil-destroying outdoor operation. But that being said, I am a true believer that our health depends on healthy soil and that it's not just an abstract idea. And in fact, we need microbes in that healthy soil to um, 
harvest nutrients from the organic matter in the soil and pass them on to the plants that then get passed them on to us. We need that soil because it in fact acts as an excellent drawdown for carbon and nitrogen in the atmosphere. So by tending our soils, we're actually actively participating in climate solutions as well. We need that soil because it's the underpinning of community and um, creating healthy jobs and so on. I mean, there are many, many reasons why uh, that soil-based agriculture needs to flourish. And that being said, we need to understand the rules for protecting and cherishing our soil. And it turns out in all these years of doing this work that the rules are really simple. They're basically the same rules you apply to protecting and nourishing your own body. You want to feed it a diversity of whole foods. You don't want to disturb it by plowing it and putting a lot of sides on it, whether it be pesticides or herbicides or antibiotic sides. Um, and uh, you want to conserve resources for it. You want to regenerate the water and regenerate the nutrients in organic matter and you know, it, it, um, keep them actually localized and in place. So it's not just localizing the food, but localizing the food waste and everything else as well. And when we follow those principles, we do an excellent job of uh, filtering our water, protecting our air, nourishing ourselves, taking care of communities, the economics of, you know, of, of a community and creating local jobs. And that this is not just a rural phenomenon, that we can uh, practice all of these soil care principles in urban areas as well, and that it seems to have a huge benefit. Thank That's, you for that. Did I answer a question? Yeah, that was good. <laughs> um, I, I'd like you to talk a little bit, A, about um, the role of chefs and restaurants in all of this, how, however you'd like, but it would seem to me how chefs and restaurants restaurants can play an educational role in this, but also you have a farm, so you have something to say about this too. Well, yes, oh, so well, thank you. It's, 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 it's th those conversations are so amazing, but I, 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 want, I want to say something. Um, I remember when we, we met the first time, we talked about also the increase of the population. Mm. And it's also, we, we, we talk about, you know, the farming and how that will affect, you know, the farming uh, way and um, it's, um, you know, for me, it's very interesting because it's just like you bring like balance to things. Mm -hmm. But also, I want to also, you talk about um, um, community that also needs to afford this. And, you know, as, as a chef, you know, I'm having, a, I, mean, I mean, I have to tell you that I remember when I started cooking, I think vegetables were costing nothing. And today is, is expensive, you know, you you get, I don't know, a case of tomato and it's like $50. And obviously we want to make sure that, you know, we're using, you know, organic food and where everything, I mean, we make our own tomato, but, so how do we get there to make sure that also producing this is afford affordable to everyone mm -hmm. and give a chance to everyone? Um, yes, some of my restaurants are expensive because I have a lot of people working also. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's worth it, by the way, too. So. <laughs> but there is, I mean, I'm conscious of that. And I think as a chef, and you have to, you have to reflect of who you are and where you're going. And every day is, is we, you have to question about what you're doing and, and also bring the team together to be conscious and understand. So um, I'm, I'm not a vegetarian, I'm not a pescatarian, but I have to tell you that two of my restaurants serve only vegetable and, 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 and uh, fish that has been given to us. So um, it, was, it was a big decision for me to also be a part of understanding the meat production also in the, um, in the country, but also to give uh, the understanding that vegetables are amazing mm -hmm. and they need to be a part of our own diet, you know. Um, and every day, w once again, every day is another day. It's a process and it's about education and it's about learning. Um, having the farm, it was also um, a very important part of who we are and understanding how, 
how we can, um, first of all, how we grow food and understanding the soil and, 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 gi and be a part of, so, of that change. Um, and also, uh, it's, it's a place also of education where, you know, we're not opening restaurants and serving food just to serve food. It's, it has to have a purpose. So uh, we're very lucky to have a farm because not every chef can have a farm. But if, we do, if you don't have a farm, understand, you know, the impact of what you're putting on the plate. And that's very important. If chefs could understand that too, um, I think the world would be such, maybe, maybe a better world. And, um, and for me, it's, it's, it's to find, you know, maybe more solution and to be a part of, of, of the changes. And, but my question is, is how are we gonna grow food with, I don't know, how many people are gonna live in 2050? Oh. Yeah, so it's, I mean, it's expected to be somewhere between nine and 10, depending on whose projections you, you look at. And, and that is actually potentially the, the smaller effect. Rising incomes actually are, are expected to be a massive effect on what people consume as well. And if you look at the FAO projections of how, many, how much more food we need, they would suggest that over the next uh, decade and a half, roughly, we need something on the order of 10 Californias fully planted out across the planet. Uh, or India plus Pakistan, fully planted out, that, that kind of a footprint. But uh, we, don't, we don't have the land to do that. No, yeah. no, it's not, there's, it's not there. I, I actually haven't heard uh, that statistic, but I, I wanted to get back to this idea of the question we always seem to ask ourselves that immediately sends us into a panic, which is how are we going to feed 9 billion or how are we going to feed the world? And I hear this same conversation whether I'm at the FAO or you know, in, at medical conferences or what have you. And honestly, I've come to realize that it might be the wrong question. Uh, because immediately when you ask that question, what you're assuming is that food is this globalized commodity and that we need to produce in point A to get it to point B. And it, I think the right question to ask is how is each community going to feed itself? What is the right way for each region yeah. to nourish itself? Yeah. And when you look at indeed how some of the most mindful and effective agriculture is happening around the world, it is through small and localized farms still, even though we you know, all hear about the big industrial solutions most agriculture is still pretty small and localized. 70% and, of the world's. Yeah, 70, <laughs> 80, somewhere around there. And it's really about taking those systems and optimizing them. And not so much all of a sudden thinking that we have to transform the globe into a garden for the globe or you know, a field for the globe, but really how do we optimize this for each community? I think I, th I totally agree with you, but I have to. Um, I just came back from Oslo, and I was talking to um, um, and, um, local people, indigenous people that are, I think this Subnik. I think this is the name. They are um, ran their order, and and they were the, the young lady was kind of. Um, I was curious about the community and the food system and. And, um, you know, through the years, obviously, there's been tradition and food system, which is great. I mean, you go to South of America, you go to Mexico, you go to a lot of area that go back to that. But she was, she, it was a very interesting point that she made also. She said, but with the climate change, we are also losing our resources. Mm -hmm. So it's, something needs to happen. So, um, you know, um, westernize everything everywhere. This I'm not for that. I think everyone should be able to um, really understand. You know, even in America, you know, I, we were just talking about um, kind of the Native American uh, culture and the food culture, which is kind of interesting when you study that. And the, there was a food system before. America become what America was is today, and so it would, it would be interesting to understand. Okay, so there is some problem we're gonna need to tackle and how we can do that without um, kind of taking away the core of that culture, of that community. Mm -hmm. 
because I mean, you go up to Alaska and you know, like, and a part of where the Eskimo also live, and they tell you that they're having a hard time to go and get the fish from the sea, and so there is something it's happening too, and th they are c kind of confused now. So what is the way that we're going to eat? So that would be also interesting to 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 know that and to to help with that. And but I agree with you. I think we need to understand each community. Yeah, I think yeah, Daphne brings up an interesting point is, uh, around what is the right question to ask, uh, and that there's a there's a nuance. Um, it's it's not so much ab about feeding the world as it is nourishing the world. <clears throat> if you you know the food system for most of human history has been focused on calories. Uh, and it's per certainly in recent history, we've kind of built a machine, if you will, or a system that has become incredibly efficient at delivering calories to people. Uh, and calories per dollar uh, is a metric that, that we're doing quite well on. <clears throat> and even after wasting 20 to 30% of the food that's grown, uh, there's, there's more than enough calories for everybody on the planet. Uh, there's, a, there's a surplus in excess. Uh, but that has produced a situation where we have these high calorie, low nutrient diets. Uh, that is the, pr the, the predominant diet around the world is high calorie, low nutrient. And that's why we have, uh, you know, in combination with a sedentary lifestyle, we've got 70 to 80% uh, of the population here in the United States overweight, f almost 40% obese. Uh, there are uh, regions of the world where obesity is up around 60%. And, uh, you know, urban areas of China are screaming towards 30. So the, these, are, these are alarming numbers. And, uh, and, and, and really, it's this high-calorie, low-nutrient diet. And so I think asking ourselves, how is every community going to feed itself? Uh, more importantly, how is it going to nourish itself? How are we going to, uh, to reverse these dietary trends uh, and realize we have enough calories now? Let's focus on, on nutrients. So I... It, there's so much interesting stuff going on here. I don't know which one to chase, but this idea of climate change, right? Well, one of the biggest contributors to climate change is in fact agriculture. So we get ourselves in this catch-22 situation of the system, which is creating this devastating problem for the planet. We look to that system to be the solution to you know, nourish us. We've got to break the cycle somewhere. And on the other side of things, when you look for the points of light, the areas of success or promise in communities that are the most impacted by climate change, they often are areas where they're still practicing traditional agriculture, using ancient seeds that are much more thrifty when it comes to water and are more nutrient dense, um, using systems for growing that conserve and filter water and conserve local um, nutrients and that actually create cleaner local atmospheres. We are beginning to understand now that, you know, climate change can in fact be very, very localized. Within, you know, 10, 20 miles, you can create a different environment. I, I saw some interesting information uh, on this coming from Australia. Um, so it, the way you're farming in a specific region can actually have a huge impact on exactly the problem that you described. And this is the eternal question, is how do we break the cycle and start to look at our food production as part of the solution and not just a stopgap thing and, and continually perpetuating this problem. I don't have the full answer, but it's clear to me that at some point we've got to get off the merry-go-round. Well, I think everybody needs to be a, a part of the change. You know, I mean, we were, we were talking about the the, the, industrial, the industrial farming. It's maybe they need to start there. Then it's, those people need to disappear. Sorry, it's like it's true. You know, I mean. It's not food we're eating, <laughs> something that is not food. I mean, it's true. I mean, we need to start there, and, and, uh, and that will take, you know, I, I don't think a government that we have right now will do it, so maybe we need to do it as a community and just, like, doing the work. And, um, I mean, that's exciting, you know. I mean, like, those youngsters all over, you know, all over Europe are, like, you know, going out there for climate change, and if they can do it, we should do it too. We should, like maybe um, 
help you know our own community to be you know the champion and um and it's not going to be easy it's going to there's a lot of struggle but we yeah you're right we need to we, we need to stop it right now and, and there there are points of light too you mentioned uh uh, you know, who's coming in into, into the industry, into agriculture and the food system. Applications at, at uh, agriculture schools like Purdue, North Carolina State, Cornell are all on the rise uh, in a pretty big way. Uh, people are ec excited about how do we, you know, how do we feed and nourish ourselves and how do, how do we do that, uh, you know, effectively and, and, and kind of usher in the next green revolution, if you will, in a way that's better for people. Uh, and better for the planet. So uh, those those rises, it's f factors. It's you know some schools are seeing two x, some schools are seeing eight x, but there are uh, in a, 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 after s about a half century of decline, uh, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of interest and excitement. So I, I I can wear two hats. I can be the hopeful one or the pessimistic one, depending on which crowd uh. I'm in. And you guys both are sounding like hopeful ones. So I'm going to be the pessimistic one, just for the heck uh. of it. Um, how many of you are from California here? All right, a couple of you. How many of you are from like the Salinas area, which really is, as Matt said, the lettuce basket of California? Well, I, I will tell you that, I mean, this is where, you know, lots of the vegetables and many of the fruits that feed the U.S. and the world are pumped out of, you know, every season. We wouldn't have asparagus or artichokes or cilantro or probably strawberries if it were not for the for the Salinas area. And this is California, right? The most progressive state in the, in the nation, arguably. Um, and so you'd think that we would get it right at least there. Now, there is a ton of research at this point that shows one of the most important things you can do to nourish soil, draw down carbon, uh, even you know, create nutrient-dense food, is to have cover crops. Crops that grow on the land when you're not growing your, your, your cash crop, that are there to act as organic matter that you know, gets pushed into the soil, feeds uh, the microbes and so on, and, and sort of regenerates them in the season where they're not just there growing the strawberries. Well, if you drive through that area of the Salinas Valley right now, and we're in our rainy season, which is the one time of the year when we have free water, Everything is brown because we're not in production season. And so what they've done is they've tilled over everything. There's hardly any cover crops in that area, and which is like this easy, free solution in a way to nourishing the soil, nourishing the plants, nourishing ourselves. Why can't we even do it in California? You know, that's the question I'm asking. These simple changes. And these are public health changes. These are not just agriculture changes. And so that's kind of the baby step I've created for myself is, can I even start in my own state? <laughs> Where you know the, the politics and we actually agree that climate change is happening. Can we start there and make a difference and then move out from there? And since you're both my California buddies, maybe you can help me with this. Let's do it. I mean, I would, I would say this, the fundamental, the fundamental issue is that the food system, to the extent that there is one, because one could argue that it's really just a bunch of um, rich people running corporations going crazy doing what they want to do, the, the bottom line is that the food system is run for profit, and that there's no one saying... Inefficiency. Well, if you're efficient, you're profitable. So... There's no one who's saying to us or to, or to these folks, how would we organize a food system if we could start from scratch if we were to do so? And I think the answer would not be, we're gonna organize a food system that's as profitable as it can possibly be and pays no attention to people's health, the planet's health, and so on down the line. We would probably say something like, we wanna organize a food system that provides the best nutrition possible for the most people possible in as fair a way as possible while treating the land as well as we possibly can. What's the first step in that? How do we get to that place? Because in a way, all the research, all the money, um, much of the energy goes into promoting and improving 
the efficiency and the profitability of the existing food system. No work, no public work, no public money goes into saying, how do we build what's actually a better food system, a more fair food system? I mean, the statistic I thought you were going to say before when I didn't interrupt you or started to and stop was 70% of the world's food supply is produced using 30% of the resources, which means that 70% of the people in the world use um, a third of the resources that are available for agriculture. It also means that 30% of the people in the world are using 70% of the resources available for agriculture, which is exactly a description of sort of peasant farming versus industrial farming. And I think the fundamental question is how do we get people to get with the idea that we were talking about this before, that food is important, that food is the primary public health issue and public health in a way is the primary issue facing us all. How do we all be healthy, get healthy, maintain a healthy planet, so on? Big question, obviously. I don't think we had the answer, but I think I will. Um, be. I can propose something. I don't know anything, so I just, but I think I have an idea. Um, I think it would be nice to uh, introduce the education of, of, of what food mm -hmm. is about and nutrition in, at school first. Mm -hmm. I think that would be very important. Um, when you have when you have people that are educated at, at, at a young age and you give them the information, it has shown that I think they make better choices. I mean, that's what I'm thinking. Uh, I mean, obviously, uh, you got to push away those people that just think about greed, you know. <laughs> There's so many right now. And it's to, uh, to have a different vision, you know, I mean, but how do you get that there? You know, we live in a world of like instant gratification. You have to do this to this, you know, or if you invest in something or if you have an idea, it's like, well, okay, well, I can invest in that, but how much money I'm going to make in the next few years with you? And instead of have that, maybe it's the future of this planet, future of the world, going back to who are we as human, you know, and maybe this is where we need to start, but... I would say <clears throat> there's a lot to that. You, you can see actually uh, when you involve kids in the planting of seeds, the growing of plants, uh, they tend to treat it less like an alien on their plate uh, that they don't know what to do with or that they'd want nothing to do with uh, into something that they're super interested in. And so there's re I mean, really cool programs at, at, at schools, some of which we've, we've participated in, where uh, you know the kids are going home and uh, and like pushing vegetables on their family, <laughs> because because they had so much fun growing them in the first place. Mm -hmm. So uh, so there's definitely something to that. As opposed to pushing breakfast cereals on their family. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Um, closing so, well, comments because we're going to take some questions. I think just once again back in, getting back to this idea that there needs to be a you know pl a multitude of solutions and certainly. Uh, consumer education is one piece of it uh, and a very important piece, but I don't think we can educate ourselves out of this problem. Um, I do think that really it is getting back to root causes and we're, it's really, uh, you know, wrong plants grow, being grown in the land. Uh, farmers uh, really need, needing to be supported to change practices. And then understanding that it is not just a nice, clean uh, demand supply system. And that in fact, profit in many places isn't what is driving these bad choices. I mean, farmers in the middle of this country are growing, going broke growing this bad food for us. And I have met many of them. And they need to start to see another way and be supported, you know, in, in terms of repurposing their land and thinking about different systems that they, um, under which they can grow nutrient dense food. And maybe it is still commodity crops, but for example, not all wheat is created equal. And can we start to grow more ancient varietals of wheat in the Midwest? And can we, you know, intercrop with other things and so on? So, um, you know, and unfortunately, all of this profit is not trickling down to the farms. A lot of it is being stuck in the middle with, you know, the general mills and, the, you know, all of the people who are processing this stuff. Uh, and, you know, some of them are getting on board. For ex I, I think it is General Mills who's sort of committing to regenerative agriculture, 
whatever that means. I don't, I, who knows? <laughs> uh, but X number of acres. But the truth is, as long as we're just transforming the raw ingredients into things that we can't recognize and that sit there in the middle of the supermarket and have enormous shelf life, um, we're, we're not going to change the food system. Um, and so uh, there, there are lots of, I, I'm just raising more issues here in closing. So. <laughs> Clo let's, let's the end of the world. Up. Anything final you want to say, Dominique, uh, Matt? No, I mean, it's, it's, for me, it's very interesting. Okay, like some questions. So this is definitely, uh, this is our top, our top um, question is, how can local food scale? And, you know, it's the question we get, all of us get all the time, and I'll just read the rest of the original question, which is vertical farming is great, but the millions of people need to be fed, billions, in fact. So we deal with this all the time, but Matt, it, I'm sure you deal with it even hourly, so. <laughs> Yeah, so, so again, I, I, would, I, I would just put out there that at, at plenty, as we look at the problems first in America and then outside of our borders, uh, the larger problem does seem to be not calories. It's not about necessarily feeding people. It's how do we give people a higher quality diet. It's, the, it's the, the distribution of those calories and the quality of those calories. And so we're really focused on how do you make nutrient-rich food just really taste good and, and, and be available to people in a way that they w want to buy it. Because if, if you can't afford, um, no one likes to throw their food away. Uh, and the less money you make, the less you can afford to throw your food away. So we're, you know, we're trying to eliminate that problem. Uh, and that's, those are the things that we feel like we need to focus on in order to help people be healthier. I mean, I would, this is a very complicated issue, obviously. I mean, and a lot of what we're tackling is, but, um, I would argue that part of the answer to this question is restoring the dignity to farming and restoring the dignity to farming oh. and that um, that farmers have traditionally been stewards of the soil and that we need stewards of the soil but farming has also traditionally been an occupation that that um, the majority of the population mm -hmm. took part in and that is still true in much of the world but here we have this notion that farming is too hard or beneath us or whatever it is. And yet, um, you know, we hear a lot about jobs being made obsolete. No one, there aren't <laughs> jobs for the future and so on. And if we were to turn to some kind of regional food production, some kind of real farming of real food in soil uh, that was stewarded by real people, we would have um, much dignified work for many, many people. And that that is an interesting project um, that at the moment is an insurmountable question because of the cost of land, the cost of getting into farming. But that I think in the long run is one worth tackling. I, I totally agree. And I, you know, I, from a physician's perspective, I started to spend time with farmers about 15 years ago. And I realized that to do you know, localized, regenerative farming requires so much more knowledge and education than it does to be a doctor, for example. <laughs> I was blown away by how, and, you know, how much you have to know and how much you have to sort of be nimble and respond to your environment uh, as, as a farmer. And I, I think that if we can really start to have, you know, incomes, and um, you know, sort of uh, respect that, that 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 matches the skill that is needed. Uh, that you know, that would be a massive shift. And uh, so, I hope all of you are going to be farmers. <laughs> um, this is a related question, and it's also a question we get a lot, which is: Is local food only an option for the affluent? How can we grow food locally that? Um, is affordable enough so that non-affluent people can afford it. So we are focused on that at plenty. I mean, there's if you look at the the, the strongest predictors of what people buy and what's in their diet, uh, you know, the strongest predictors of whether or not people eat nutrient-rich food, fruits and vegetables, are income and how close they are to a Mediterranean climate. And there are only a few of those in the world. There are a few of them in California. There's five total. 
So you've got California, you've got the actual Mediterranean, South Africa, a, a part of Chile, and, uh, Australia. and then Australia. And so uh, the, the acres in those places are six to 15 times more productive on an annual basis than any other arable acre uh, in the world when it comes to growing fruits and vegetables, which is why fruits and vegetables end up being grown in those places. Uh, and so, um, so for sure, I mean, when you, t when you take out 3,000 truck miles uh, and, and you take out a lot of that perishability and you make things, uh, you know, it's been shown that when you tell someone <clears throat> that it's gonna last a week longer in their fridge, they buy more fruits and vegetables. Uh, they buy a lot more fruits and vegetables, as a matter of fact. <clears throat> so perishability ends up being uh, you know, one of the most important drivers of whether or not people consume uh, fruits and vegetables. And uh, that's just one area that we're focused, to, focused on to fix. I mean, I would, I would say that this is not an overnight solution and that if you are looking at regional food with more farmers, on working on smaller plots, using better techniques and better methods, producing better food, then the cost becomes more affordable. But obviously a question about whether people can afford things is not only a food question, it's a political, economic, society-wide question. So it has to be, food has to be addressed in the context of bigger issues. Bigger issues have to be addressed in the context of food. Anyway, uh, this is an interesting question, uh, which is, how concerned should I be about production of local food being produced in urban areas where there's heavy pollution? I actually don't know the answer to that question. Well, we actually, uh, Philip Stark, who's here in the audience, and I and uh, two other investigators did a study in uh, Oakland, um, which I came in on fairly l late in the process. Uh, but it was actually looking at wild and feral foods that are growing around in some of the more industrialized and polluted areas of Oakland. Uh, foods that you can pick in the wild but that are, have culinary value, uh, things like a mallow and dandelion and, and so on. Um, and uh, they actually, uh, in, in, as part of the study, did soil tests and then did tissue tests on the plants themselves. And a lot of the soil tests actually showed that there were contaminants in these areas. There were heavy metals, there were pesticides, there were herbicides. But then when we did tissue te tests on the plants themselves, we found that in fact they were all safe to eat pretty much. Um, and so there is a big difference as it turns out because of those wonderful soil microbes and because of the filtration systems in plants. There, there's a lot of, you know, layers that things have to go through in order um, uh, before they, they make it into the tissue of the plant. Um, based on this study, would I say just grow food anywhere and not be afraid uh, to eat it? No. But I, what it, I'm saying is that there's actually a lot more to investigate there about this, and we shouldn't just make an assumption that because uh, you know urban soil has been exposed more to industry and so on, that it is not an appropriate place to grow food. And you know we should be doing tissue testing on plants in in different gardens and and making sure that you know in. in perhaps being a lot braver about eating out of those soils because not only is that a great source of nutrition and localized food, but it's also a chance to regenerate and restore those abused soils. Super interesting finding on that. Study. It's in PLOS if you want to check it out. Uh, the title of the, the article is... Help. Open source food, yeah. If you just Google open source food, Stark, S-T-A-R-K, you'll find it. Uh, PLOS one. <laughs> uh, next question, is there a place for meat in a sustainable food system? I sure hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you look at the Eat Lancet report that came out just like a month or two ago, uh, it's clear that, uh, generally speaking, we have w way too much meat in our diet. Uh, way too much animal protein and not enough plants, but gosh, I sure hope that there's a place for, us in, uh, for meat in that system because I sure do like it. I mean, there's a big difference between the way we eat meat now and, of course, as you said before, um, 
it's not how do we feed the nine billion or the 10 billion, it's what do people eat? And for um, the statistic I've been using for years, which I think is, is true, is that if everyone were to eat like Americans eat, we'd need four Earths in order to feed them all. That's, which is as ridiculous as planting out a new India and Pakistan. Um, so the rate at which we eat meat is not sustainable. The rate at, w rate at which Americans eat meat is not sustainable. But, the, but there's a big difference between that and nothing. Um, and I think most people who are experts in agroecology and sustainable farming and regenerative agriculture will say that animals have, um, at least for now, that animals have a role in that agriculture. And if you have animals, then you have meat. I think I agree, you know. Um, obviously, you have three restaurants. There's two that there is no, we, we're not using meat product, but there's one we're using meat product. And the way that we, we dealing with rancher around that, you know, if, we, if it's a, if it's for example, if it's a pig, or we're gonna buy the old animal and then we're gonna do it. But I agree that I think it's all about balance and the way that we've been eating meat has been just over consume, and um, but also the, the way that meat has been produced has been a big problem. So I think we can go back to. Um, to have a more balance and maybe to have farmers also that take care of their animal and that just, we can change so many things, but we just have to be willing to do it. So, but I don't have the answer, but I'm just, you know. Well, I, I'm so glad we're talking about meat because it actually, <laughs> the reason I do this work is because it's so beautiful how when you get it right, everything fits together. And the meme that I'm trying to get out there about meat is, let's use our meat to grow our vegetables. Which is this idea that, in fact, the best use for animals is to fertilize soil, regenerate soil. And we understand that when we manage you know, our, our four-legged and some two-legged friends, um, in a way that is through rotational grazing and moving them around uh, from field to field, much the same way that uh, wild animals roam in packs, pull up a lot of the forbs and the greens, put their own nutrition back into the soil in the form of their manure, and then move on in a pack to the next paddock, and don't come back to that original paddock until it's been regenerated. We understand that that's actually a beautiful way to regenerate soil and prepare it to grow vegetables. And so if we were to use animals in that system and eat them when we retire them from that system, <laughs> that would be the right proportion to eat those animals in terms of our health. And it's the right proportion to have them on the land in terms of you know, growing our food and, you know, climate, health, and so on. And that's why I love doing this work, because we are a part of that system, and when we do it right, it works for our health, it works for soil health, it works for plant health, and so on. So use your meat to grow your vegetables, you know? Beautiful. I think on that note, <laughs> I'll thank you, and um, we can retire. Matt, Daphne, Dominique, thanks very thank much. You. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, guys.